I would like to call the January 12, 2022 City Council meeting to order. Will everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Chilson? Present. Council Member Parker? Present. Hutchings? Present. Ruffridge? Here. Nelson? Here. Carey? Here. Student Representative Knowles? Present. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the agenda and consent agenda? Ms. Um, Hutchings? Thank you. I'll second. Uh, may I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Chilson, thank you. Are there any changes to the agenda or consent agenda? Vice Mayor Parker. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. I move to add lay down resolution 2022-002, amending the authorized uses for COVID-19 community funding from the State of Alaska Department of Health and Social Services grant to include temporary emergency leave for city employees to the regular agenda as agenda item 8D2. Mr. Ruffridge, I have a note here that uh, you will state a possible conflict with resolution, with that resolution. I thought I would declare that when we get to the resolution, but yes, I can uh, declare an objection uh, um, to adding the laydown item um, because I have a possible conflict with laydown resolution 2022-002. I'm the principal, one of the principal owners of Inlet Pharmacy Group that does business as Soldatna Professional Pharmacy currently receiving allocated grant funds through a subrecipient agreement. Thank you. Okay, a conflict does exist and Council Member Ruffridge will abstain from discussion and voting on Resolution 2022-002. Uh, can I have a vote on the uh, Resolution 2022 to the adding it to the regular agenda? Council Member Carey? Yes. Chilson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Nelson? Yes. You have five yes votes and one abstention. And uh, resolution 2022-002 will be added to the agenda. Uh, would the clerk please uh, read the consent agenda? Approval of the December 15, 2021 council meeting minutes. Ordinances for introduction, ordinance 2022-001 increasing estimated revenues and appropriations by $3,611 in the general fund for forfeited property introduced by the city manager, public hearing on January 26, 2022. Other items, action item, action memorandum 2022-001, vacate a 1,936 square foot portion of Endicott Drive cul-de-sac within lot one, block one, Slycock Creek, Alaska subdivision, plat number K1361. The right of way being vacated is unconstructed and located within the southeast quarter of section 36, township five north, range 11 west, Seward Meridian, Alaska, within the Kenai Peninsula Borough. Kenai Peninsula Borough file 2021-151B, introduced by the acting city clerk. And that is your consent agenda. Thank you. Are there any public comments on any of the items just read by the clerk? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand. If you would like to comment, app users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. Is there anyone here in the chambers that would like to speak? Seeing none, I... The consent agenda. And seeing no hands raised, um, There's no one uh, wishing to speak. The approval of the agenda and consent agenda is back before the council. Are there any council objections to approving the agenda and consent agenda? Hearing and seeing none, the agenda and consent agenda are approved. Move on to item four on the agenda, public comments and presentations. Uh, uh, items uh, other than those appearing on the agenda, three minutes per speaker, 20 minutes aggregate. Are there any members from the public who would like to speak on any item not appearing on the agenda? Waited nine years 
for this to be on the other side. Uh, Pete Monarch, um, Sabatna. No, I really, I really wanted to say thank you uh, to the city of Sabatna and council. Uh, during my time as a police chief, uh, you guys always had my back. You always supported. I, I never ever felt that um, you were, uh, you know, when when issues came up that you were taking the other side. And I, I really appreciate that. And and having the opportunity to work in Sabatna, um, this is a new experience from being at the state. So many opportunities to change things without all the red tape. And um, so I just want to publicly say thank you um, for your support uh, through those years. Um, and also um, wanted to say thank you to City Manager Queen. I think she's doing some good stuff and uh, uh, I like what I see. And um, I just hope you really show her support in a meaningful way. And I'm, sh I'm sure that you do, but it's, um, you know, when they say it's lonely at the top, it is. You don't. You don't have a lot of peer support, and you're her peer support. So make sure you support her. So thank you. Yep, don't don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> yes, is there anyone from the council who would like to make any comments or say anything? Mr. Chilson. I, I I think I speak for the council when I say we're all deeply appreciative for all your years of service to the city. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Queen. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, and I didn't get to say it at the barbecue, but I'll say it now, especially now that your lovely wife's with you. Um, I appreciate the nine years you've given to the city in addition to what you gave the community when you were with the troopers, but you led the department with honesty and integrity and you maintained the public trust that entire time, which is really difficult to do because you have to earn it every single day. And I think you've shown that through your actions, you're handing off the department in a really good position in terms of the level of professionalism that we've achieved. So thank you for your service, and I really enjoyed working with you. Thanks. Vice Mayor Parker. Thank, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, Chief, thank you. Um, I would ditto what the city manager said. So it's been great working with you, and I know we'll see you around town. So thank you for your years of service, and um, enjoy all your fun projects. And... Not done yet. It looks like your razor retired at the same time. It did. Yeah. I have you know, had to do this for 31 years. <laughs> that's actually that's uh, kind of what happened when I left the, the department. And I haven't shaved since. Uh, but it's been a pleasure working with you, Chief. Uh, you're always going to be the chief. Uh, you might as well get used to hearing that from from the continued on. Um, you've done a great job. The city really appreciates the work you've done. Um, personally, I hate to see you go, uh, but I know what it, what it feels like uh, to want to do something else and, and, and change, change course. Um, I've worked under many chiefs over the years, and I will honestly say you were probably the best one that uh, I've seen and had the pleasure to work with. So good luck in your future. Uh, definitely we want to see you around here. Keep active. We we have a lot of commissions available and seats, uh, so we can keep we can keep you active. So, thank you again. Thank you again. Now, I will continue on with what I was going to say. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on any item not appearing on the agenda? Uh, for those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. Is there anyone else here in the chambers that would like to say anything? Seeing none, I see no hands raised. So we'll move on to the next item. Assem Assembly and legislative report. Are there any representatives from the borough or the state in attendance who would like to speak? I see none here in the chambers and I see none on Zoom. So we'll move on to the next one. Administrative reports, uh, project update, uh, report from the administration. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, I'm gonna uh, ask Public Works Director Kyle Cornelis to come up to the microphone uh, along with CO Rudstrom. And if you haven't had a chance to meet CO, he's our project manager in the Public Works Department, been with us for just over a year now. And they're gonna run through the memo, uh, giving you an update on where we're at in terms of projects, capital projects that were either completed in the last calendar year or are significantly underway. I'll hand it off. Thanks, guys. So 
thank you. Um, we have in front of you is kind of a, uh, a select list of projects. It's a really broad list. Some of them are small, some of them are big. Some of them were primarily procurement uh, and purchasing type efforts, um, which is you know, time consuming as well. Uh, things like a, like a tree purchase where, uh, where our parks department did the installation. But we won't go over every one of these projects um, in, in detail, but maybe we'll talk about a few select uh, projects and a few key points on them. The last two pages are just a few random pictures uh, from 2021 of some of the projects that are um, described on the previous pages. And then, and then one beautiful uh, fake rendering of what uh, the front entry to the sports center might look like at, in the construction. So um, we'll keep it pretty informal. Uh, we kind of cranked out this, this list recently. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me or ask any uh, or CEO any questions. Uh, again, CEO Lutrum has been, been here uh, for, yeah, a bit over a year and has been a tremendous asset to the public works department and, and, um, and um, uh, project management as his primary primary role. CEO has got a great background in uh, mechanical engineering and uh, civil engineering and a lot of hands-on stuff. So I was just talking to him about my boiler, getting tips from, from him on personal projects. So any questions before we start about, about these, uh, these capital projects and, and lists of um, work that was done in 2021? Okay, uh, they're kind of broken up first, kind of the first page are, are projects that were completed in 2021 and the next few pages are active projects. And um, most capital projects span multiple fiscal years. It's, it's you know, really those small ones that, are, that, are, um, that we're able to initiate and accomplish all in say one construction season or one fiscal year. So um, you'll see that, that some of the bigger projects are, are still active, but they may have been started in 2021 or even before. Um, but they are broken out by the, by the year of, of which ones were completed in 2021 and which ones are ongoing. Um, and if I don't get to one of, uh, one of the projects that catches your eye, feel free to, to ask us a question uh, anytime or afterwards. The first one, Well E Core Tech Upgrade, is a pretty fun project. Uh, you'll know we used CARES Act money for that. Um, if you recall, early in the pandemic, uh, you could not get your hands on hand sanitizer or disinfecting wipes or anything of that nature. Um, I remember our maintenance manager, uh, Sunberg, brought over two uh, disinfecting wipes and said, oh, there's actually some on the shelf, but you can only get two, and immediately a handful of city hall employees went over and got two each. Um, so this, this project really was a sweet spot in, in using CARES Act funds to accomplish uh, the goals and objectives of CARES Act funding in, in uh, mitigating pandemic issues um, and also um, uh, achieving long-term benefit to the city and, and our utility fund. And what, what this project did is allow us to replace an, old, an older sodium hypochlorite generation system at one of our well houses uh, that essentially produces bleach using salt water and electricity. It's a pretty neat uh, system. Uh, it's what we use to disinfect our drinking water before distributing it uh, throughout our mains. The unit we had at Wellhouse E was one of the early ones uh, and was undersized. Um, we, we were providing some of that bleach to different departments, including the police department, um, but we didn't have the capacity to produce excess amounts of it and still meet demands for our, our uh, uh, drinking water system. So um, we were able to uh, replace that existing old system at Well E and upsize it so that we would have an ample amount of disinfectant for use um, with, in our different departments and in the community. So it was a pretty neat project. Um, we were able to accomplish most of it in-house too, uh, other than uh, the equipment manufacturer and, and uh, the functional checkout by by their team, and then uh, a few subcontractors, electrical and control specialists. But our um, empl uh, utility employees uh, purchased the parts and pieces and assembled piping and skids and, and really saved a, a bunch of money um, and did most of the work themselves, which was pretty impressive. So um, that's the Well E Cortec project, a, a pretty fun, exciting project, if you ask me. Uh, landscape curve, downtown tree purchase, uh, Sterling Highway, Riverside Drive, right-of-way improvements. 
these are kind of related projects uh, associated with right away beautification and I know that council had noted in the past how beautiful our downtown looked and um, you know these projects were a collaboration between you know, the Parks Department the Planning Department Public Works um, and uh, really I think had a visual impact on on our downtown area um, it, you know DOT permitting there's a lot of a lot of behind the scenes work that went into just planting a tree in the right away uh, asked John Sarneski about the, the process to get permission just to do it um, so those were, were kind of fun projects that had a real tangible visual impact on our downtown. I promise I'll let you talk at some point, CEO. Uh, City Hall renovation. This was this is really a preliminary investigation. Um, there's no construction funding for it at this point, but um, you know conceptual level design and investigation on, on this building here, um, with the goals of, of improving customer service, um, coming into <coughs> compliance with. Uh, Appropriate building codes and particularly ADA uh, for example our front counter is not ADA compliant um, we do provide um, accessible accessible means uh, as needed so we're, we're meeting the intent but it's really not not up to stuff you know we shouldn't have to provide uh, alternative means when when that need is, is there so we need to we need to address things like that um, it also we're also looking into the number of, of offices and ability to to uh, be um, nimble with with number of employees and, and where our offices are and then also some efficiency and, and reliability of our buildings CO did a deep dive on on the mechanical systems of our uh, of this building um, and included work from a uh, mechanical engineering consultant um, question yeah absolutely. it's okay if I take them this way and when yes you I, I, I'm just interested kind of when you mentioned the ADA compliant are you saying that we haven't been ADA compliant um, I think there's some issues, you know, the, uh, the counter, the height of the counter uh -huh. and whatnot doesn't meet modern ADA code. And if someone needs those, you know, someone comes in a, wheel, in a wheelchair, right. thing, we have to bring forms around to them or come out of the table at the side. So we, we, we provide reasonable accommodations. Yeah. But, so, but what I'd like, what we would like to do is not have to provide reasonable accommodation and just be fully ADA compliant. So let me try again. I, I heard the word modern in that. So let me ask again, are we compliant? Yes. Because we have the adaptation. Reasonable accommodations. And so, okay, so we're reasonable, and we're now going to talk about the concept by which we become more than just reasonable. Where we don't need to take any action in order to provide fully ADA compliant services, correct? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of humorous. We impose that on other people and... For how long have we been not totally, completely fully? A, a good example would be um, uh, multiple restroom facilities. You know, say say that uh, there is a uh, restroom facility that's not ADA compliant, but you provide an, uh, a reasonable accommodation an alternative, so that you are providing it. In this case, in the front counter, we we have the lower desks and tables, and we we make adjustments as needed. But it, it would be better if everything, if, if all bathrooms were ADA compliant. For example, and back to that example. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will talk about the airport, and then I'll let CEO talk a little bit about the uh, cemetery. Um, if you made it out to the uh, Soldotton Airport, you saw a lot of activity this summer. Um, we had a uh, significant grant from the FAA to allow us to completely reconstruct our runway. Uh, we pulverized all the existing asphalt. Uh, we modified the center line profile to get rid of a small hump in the runway, which uh, inhibited the line of sight of um, pilots who are sitting on one end of the runway. Um, with the small hump and small airplanes, it, may have, it, was, it was very close to where they would have difficulty seeing an aircraft at the, at the other end of the runway due to a, a vertical curve, if you will. So this project uh, took that curve out, basically flattened the runway. It also, uh, because we were doing that, we were able to completely replace all the edge lighting, the, the newest technology for um, airport lighting. Um, all the taxiway tie-ins got redone. Uh, the existing nav aids, the VASIs, were replaced with uh, PAPIs, uh, as, as requested by the, uh, the uh, FAA visual approach.
approach slope indicator to precision approach slope indicator. Um, we also had uh, the runway shut down for most of the summer, uh, and we have a busy airport, and we had the parallel taxiway, uh, Bravo, um, striped and painted and in use as a temporary runway for the entire summer. Um, we, we received, I think, mixed to no complaints. In fact, most of the comments that re uh, were received in my office and in maintenance were positive. Um, it was a really smashing success. It's not 100% complete. We're, we have, um, we've got a change order. We got authorization from FAA to replace uh, some voltage regulators in, in our lighting building. It'll take place next, uh, next spring. It's a long lead item. And then um, a lot of miscellaneous grading and drainage and stuff like that. So, um, as part of the reconstruction of the runway, there was was it reconstructed at the same size as the previous runway, or was there any expansion to support larger aircraft there in the future? It was. Thank you for the question, uh, Councilman Chilson. It was reconstructed to the same size. Um, <laughs> however, the uh, excavation that we did, there was a lot of um, uh, waste material. We were able to fill in the, uh, it was essentially it was a pond, seasonal pond, that we got a jurisdictional determination from the Army Corps that it was not a, um, a wetland and we could fill it in. And then we also had excess, and so beyond the runway, we were able to use uh, another waste area that would enable a future um, runway expansion. So the, uh, the current project did not change the runway dimensions, but it did somewhat enable future expansions should it be necessary. Okay, thank you. Just in terms of understanding, again, this being the huge projects of the, the whole list. Um, when we do something like this, when something like this is done, do we actually do it? Or are we the ones that are hiring everyone? Or, or does the FAA come in and, and basically kind of tell us who's going to do it and we, we can kind of oversee and watch? And I'm going to assume that whoever we hire, they hire their own subcontractors, but I'm open if that's not accurate. But who, how... How much do we actually get to do as to compared to how much does the FAA have their hands on our necks? Thank you for the question, Mr. Carey. Uh, the FAA uh, provides the funding and uh, a stack of rules, but they do not um, they do not do any of the pur purchasing, procurement, bidding. Uh, that is up to the sponsor, which is us, the city. Yep. So we uh, we apply for the grant and we get the grant for a particular project based on a cost estimate. Um, this is kind of a weird part. The grant is actually based on the bid you get. So you have a, uh, an estimated grant amount <laughs> and then um, the city, uh, we don't have the in-house design uh, staff uh, to do the design ourselves, so we solicit for professional services to do the design uh, as needed. Um, enter in a contract with that design firm at our discretion, following the federal procurement rules. So uh, we choose that 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 professional. They do the design. We are then uh, we then seek permission to bid the project from FAA based on the results of the design and the construction cost estimate. They authorize the the bidding of the construction portion of it, uh, and then we enter in a contract with, generally speaking, the low bid, and the grant amount is based on that amount of the low bid with a 15% contingency allowable. So so it is, all of the tools are in the city's, uh, city's pocket. We are responsible for uh, all forms of grant compliance and, and project delivery. Follow up. Just, I'm, you, you got to it right away, on the contingency. So if there is some of the contingency left over, do we get to keep it? Negative. We, we do not. In fact, we need to justify each and every expenditure. The change order I spoke of about the voltage regulators uh, is a good example. Um, it's actually, that was actually um, uh, an issue we realized later. You know, if we would have caught it during design, we would have incorporated it into the original contract documents. But as we uh, replaced all the edge lighting and started popping circuits and having issues, we, we recognized that those voltage regulators were 30-something years old and um, have been repaired a number of times. We provided a, uh, my initial request to FAA resulted in uh, a request for more information, and we, um, we asked the contractor to and, and consultant to provide some additional information to verify 
the quality and capability of those voltage regulators, long story short, we went back to FAA and said, um, they're, they're on the verge of failure for the following reasons. Here's what they're showing, and they do need to be replaced, and they authorize that. It's been resulted in a change order. So, so the, we, do, we have to justify every dollar we spend, and we 50% uh, contingency allowance all has to be justified through FAA. And whatever is not spent is returned to FAA. Are any grant funds uh, pay to City of Salvatna employees as part of their yearly salary? Uh, Mr. Carey, no. Uh, the grant funds are only... Uh, uh, so over no, they are not paid directly to, to employees. However, uh, the, uh, the grant under the, under the Airport Improvement Program, AIP, FAA grant in this case, does allow administrative costs to be incorporated into the budget. And we do, uh, we do do that in certain projects when, when allowable. And this one, I believe we did. Uh, I don't have that figure with me. Um, so we are able to capture employee time and offset operating budget costs in that sense. So my time spent at construction meetings and reviewing plans, I can charge to the grant up to a certain amount. Excellent, thank you very much for all your input. Um, okay, I'll turn it over to the CO uh, to talk about some some of the fun cemetery projects we had this summer. All right. Uh, yes, the Memorial Park expansion. Uh, as you may know, the Memorial Park has been very popular, and they were actually uh, running out of uh, plots to sell. And uh, when we first built the Memorial Park, however many years ago, there was a planned phased expansion, and this is phase two of it. Uh, so that, that we did that project this summer uh, involved you know, cutting down a bunch of the trees and flattening it out, and a uh, bunch of landscaping, new water line for irrigation, so the uh, it's easy for the Parks and Rec guys to maintain that. They have irrigation installed there. Um, th coming up this summer, we're going to finish this phase two of doing all the decorative trees and shrubs and all that planting. Um, that will come, we're, we actually have that out to bid right now and we'll do that work this summer. Um, oh, part of the work also includes all the surveying to stake all those plots. Every single plot gets uh, a survey marker cap placed just below grade so the grass grows up, you don't see them, but they're there. Every plot is marked out. They got a numbering system. It's uh, had to work with the, with the clerk to make sure we get that all straight and keep track of which, which plot is which. Um, I guess that's a quick summary. Any questions about the project? You said this was phase two and uh, the park's been very popular. But yes. uh, are we ahead? Are we doing this sooner than we originally expected? I think we are. Now, of course, as Kyle mentioned, I've only been here for a little over a year, so that's that's before me. But that that's been my understanding. That yes, the uh, it's been filling up faster than was first expected. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that its popularity is is probably higher than we had anticipated. The, um, the phasing was really loose. It was a, I don't even want to say a rendering, but a, a conceptual plan, area one, area two, area three. Um, it was prudent to, to think about that as we had the raw land and, and built the road in there and, and made a loop so that we would have the ability to expand. But it was very, very leanly de uh, defined. So I think it is fair to say that um, you know we were fortunate to obtain this land from the borough. Um, we made it available to all borough residents, uh, not just city of Savannah residents, and I think its popularity has grown. We did do one small, it wouldn't consider it an expansion, we did uh, some clearing and grubbings um, in one small section. So this is really phase two of a, of a really planned, defined, designed phase approach. I'll just add, I th we hired Nancy Casey to come back and do the full build-out analysis, and the council approved that master plan, I think it was last year. 
But the phase two that we just constructed and opened up to the public is roughly twice as big as all the plots we previously had. So in the last 10 years, we made it through kind of that first phase. I think we, at this current rate, we would estimate this phase two is about a 20 year capacity of, of the long plots. And phase two is even just two of three, four, maybe even five. So there's a lot of area there on that parcel to expand. And I think that was part of the analysis we went through with Ms. Casey and her design work um, recently to understand what that longevity of the whole park would be. Thank you. I, I will add, uh, you know, I spent quite a bit of time on site this summer there, you know, managing, watching the contractor and checking on things. And I was uh, surprised at how many people come through and use the park just, uh, just to walk on the trails. And there's a nice trail along the river. And it was a, uh, there was quite a bit of activity there, people coming and using that space. Thank you. So I heard a number of um, comments and criticisms from the nearby property owners about the noise level and the trees being taken down. Are we going to be putting in any trees between that subdivision and the backside of the Memorial Park? Uh, yes, that, that uh, was an issue. I spoke personally with a bunch of the landowners there just to the... Uh, immediately to the north of the Memorial Park. Um, and yes, we have already planted some bunch of lilacs along that end, and there's more coming this summer. Now that we have all the big civil construction done this summer is when all the decorative planting trees and shrubs are going in. And that is part of the plan. It has been part of the plan all along is there's um, some tall trees, some shorter trees is it to screen that, that north end off. And I will say we're, it's coming at just the right time because all of that woods, you know, we cut lots of trees down. We were all dead. It's all Beetlekill spruce. And if we weren't doing this plant project, I mean, it would have just been open just using natural causes. So, so really it's going to work out good. All that dead that Beetlekill spruce is going away and we have you know, a start on these, uh, this decorative buffer between there and that, that, that neighborhood. I, I've walked that path back through there and yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of dead trees, still a lot of dead trees out there. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's more to go. Yes. We're, we'll be dealing with that. When, when you're done with your report, I have a couple other questions. Uh, I'll just add to that same topic. I think, um, <clears throat> uh, we've got about a, uh, Seventy to eighty thousand dollar project on the bid right now for the decorative landscaping at the at the Memorial Park. It's, um, I'm not sure when the bids are due. A week or two. Plenty of time so that the landscaping firms can order the decorative trees that come from all over the place. Yeah, we'll have those. Should be in the ground in June. We'll have the rest of the all the decorative planted by then. Yes, and we start. We already started a little bit with extra trees from different projects. We started a little bit last year, but the bulk of it's all going to go in. Uh, I'll jump to the next project. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant biosolids dewatering. This is, you've probably heard it as called the screw press project. Uh, kind of one of the, the final stages at the treatment plant is, is um, our aerobic digester where uh, things get pretty thick and uh, we, we try to reduce the, the waste as much as we can, but at the end we've got to pull so a lot of that, um, they're not solids, it's, it's primarily it's wet, but it's, it's got a lot of solids in it. We had a, a polymer or a thickener to, to coagulate and try and bunch all that solids up as much as we can. And then uh, it's still, you know, 90 something percent water and we need to, we need to dewater it before we dispose of it because we dispose of the sludge at the, at the landfill and, and you, you pay to play uh, to transport and to dispose of by weight. And so there's various different um, dewatering methods. So you have that, that activated sludge plant uh, and it, we you know have a lot of microorganisms and bugs if you will that um, are utilized in the in the treatment process before we discharge our effluent and so that that biomass uh, we need to dispose of on a frequent basis and it's common for all um, um, uh, aerobically digested wastewater treatment plants so um, what we have currently is a belt press. We take this product, again, we, we add a, a polymer to it, we try to thicken it, and then it just runs between rollers and we squeeze it. So 
the water drops out, and, and what you're left is filter cake, and, and that's what we, we take to the landfill. It's, it's dry, and you can crumble it, uh, but it's uh, only, what are we re achieving, 20%? So we're only really, it's, you know, it's mostly water still by weight. Uh, that belt filter press does a great job, but it is, uh, it is old. Uh, the manufacturer no longer makes them. They no longer make parts. Um, we routinely have to manufacture parts. Uh, DLM is one of our, one of our friends, um, which you don't want to have to be doing. So we looked at um, various different technologies. There's a lot of different options out there now. Um, there's you know, centrifugal force. Screw presses that, that churn and squeeze. Uh, there's um, drying beds, like in Homer. There's, you set it out and dry and just let, let, let it naturally be water. So we went through a process and <coughs> analyzed our specific sludge, our, our treatment process, and, and the results of that analysis indicated that the screw press was probably the best option for us based on, on our needs. And so at the stage of this project we're at now is we've identified a screw press as being the, the preferred technology for, for our wastewater treatment plant. We have, with the assistance of a consultant, an engineering consulting firm, issued a request for proposals to screw press manufacturers to submit their, uh, their product for uh, inclusion in our construction bidding documents. So it'll be a basis for design um, when we um, issue a invitation to bid for a contractor to reconstruct the, the building that houses this, the piping, the valving, and then uh, purchase and install this particular um, screw press unit. So um, a pro it's one of the long-term projects that's been identified in, in our, uh, our five-year plan, and I believe it's in our, um, it's, it definitely is also in our, our master plan for the wastewater treatment plant. It's one of the big critical components to, to all um, wastewater treatment plants. Good question. Um, so we, we're currently discharging that uh, over at the landfill. We're paying... Uh, by weight when we drop that over there, and the current system is maybe getting it down to 20% water. Uh, with with the new screw press system, are we going to be able to get that down even further and potentially have any cost savings by having less weight in the routine uh, waste disposal over at the landfill to offset that cost? Excellent question. You want to heal it? <laughs> the new technology is going to be about the same there's this, there's of course a, uh, you know, this analysis that squeezing more water out is complicated and expensive, and so we have to do that that down. In most operations, treatment plants here in Alaska and all over the country end up at about 20%. That's kind of the industry standard. To, to go solid. 20% solid, yeah. To, to go farther than that, it's, it's a big energy this, this process will save us on maintenance and labor. The existing machine, not only is it old and it's hard to get parts for, but it has all kinds of moving parts and belts and requires a lot of operator attention. Um, the new machines are very streamlined, very low maintenance. It's like push the button and it gets run. So, so that's great. To reduce that maintenance and labor, will be. Yeah, we, as CEO said, we don't we don't foresee a uh, a cost savings from uh, we we pay to transport it and then we also pay to dispose it. It, it uh, and it is twenty percent solid, so it's still primarily water. Uh, it does the best it can. This will probably achieve that or a little bit less. Um, but as CEO said, significant um, managerial savings in labor and operating. This thing can run at night, whereas right now when it's running, it needs constant, constant attention. <laughs> Um, it will free our team up to accomplish our, 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 everything else that's on our to-do list. So um, I do believe there'll be a, a small energy uh, component to it as well. Um, but as you said, this thing, you can set it to run at night, which was mind-boggling to me when we first looked into it. So it's, it's, it's going to be a great, a great change to our, our treatment plant and, and for our crew down there. Um, Seal, you want to touch on the, uh, the major maintenance renovation since we just issued the notice to proceed, and then I'll, I'll touch on the discharge permit, and we'll, we'll conclude and wait for final questions. Yeah, the uh, SRSC major maintenance renovation project, kind of a mouthful. That's, of course, the 
sports complex, Dice Arena. Um, the building is, I should know, 38 years old or something like that. And lots of parts of the building have just reached their useful life and need updating, new placing. Um, so th this project is going to achieve a couple goals. It's going to fix all those things. Uh, exterior doors, there are a lot of exterior doors, 80 some doors that are steel doors and they're getting rusty. They live in a tough, humid environment. So we're replacing all those doors, uh, locker room showers, fixtures there's some tile flooring and surrounds all that stuff to spruce those locker rooms up make them nicer uh, addressing some uh, concerns out in parking lot fixing up the parking and making a better uh, access and ADA parking improving that making closures easier the I'm sure if you've been in the arena you've all seen there's a big popcorn ceiling over the bleachers, which is pretty dated and stained. And that, that's going to all get replaced, updated, a bunch of seismic bracing to get that up to a more modern seismic code. Repainting the whole arena. Um, and then the Parks and Rec offices. You know, th those offices in there serve the uh, all the skaters and all the ice use, but that's really, that's the home for the parks and rec department also. And, and the way they're laid out currently is kind of awkward. I will say when I was a new citizen here 10 years ago, I remember taking a uh, community ed class or something. I had to go and pay my fee there. And you walk in and you're kind of like, is this really the right spot? Um, so, so those offices are getting a remodel, actually knocking a couple walls down and moving doors. There's a counter, kind of like here, but really tall, doesn't meet modern standards. It's actually so tall when little kids come to rent skates, they can hardly reach up and to tap the counter. So we're, we're going to fix those things, uh, fix the appearance up, make the the face of the Parks and Rec Department a little more user-friendly, a little more public. Um, I think that's all the highlights. That, that, that project, yes, we did just award that. Oh, just... A week or two ago, um, the contractor is getting all their submittals and ordering materials. Of course, everything's a long lead time these days. Um, but then construction is scheduled to start the actual construction in mid-May. Once all the uh, ice is out of the arena and all that that's done, uh, the contractor will be in there work through the summer to have the construction done before ice goes back in the fall. Mr. Kerr? So we're going to have this wonderful transformation of this facility that's been serving us for all these decades. We're going to have wonderful new paint, great new doors. We're going to have artistic things done in the locker rooms. This is going to be a facility that will continue to be a pride of our community, correct? Yes. Good, because I like that energy. Uh, as compared to talking about how old everything is. Um, because I, I think this facility has served a huge purpose. It's met a lot of needs for tens of thousands of people. And I think part of us promoting it is, to, again, uh, to have that attitude that it's going to be awesome as it will continue to serve the people here. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add one more thing. We, are, we also did... Um, Incorporate a new leaderboard sign out there, oh. which will yep, which which will be an, a you know huge part of that visual aspect, and it will uh, I think it's going to look great. It's, uh, it'll be a pretty exciting um, change to out there. It'll actually be a working sign too. I think Andrew will be excited about that. Uh, <laughs> um, but we uh, you know CO did a lot of work with the design team and with Parks uh, to uh, to look at our existing signs and our gateway signs and, and try and figure out something that worked worked well for that facility. So. The new electronic leaderboard sign is going to be have the same kind of look and feel as our as gateway signs and our other park signs, and have a you know a consistent brand for the city. So it's it's obvious that this is the city of Sobotna's sports center. Um, 
And I will, uh, I will wrap up before taking uh, further questions by talking about the, uh, one of the longer projects on this list, our, our um, Alaska Pollutant Discharge Elimination System uh, Permit Renewal, which is our um, uh, permit to uh, discharge our wastewater treatment plant effluent into the uh, receiving waters. Thought biosolids do water when you get started. Yeah. Wait till you hear the details on this. This is this this is this is good, uh, and it's exciting also. And uh, we are we have the opportunity to work with DEC and EPA um, to uh, try and adopt site specific criteria using the biotic ligand model. So um, essentially, what we're doing is um, we have concluded a, a two year sampling program that was uh, established in a. Quality assurance, quality assurance Project Program uh, uh, approved by DEC and EPA where we, we gathered a lot of data on the receiving waters and on our effluent and uh, performed a lot of studies using this uh, complex algorithm and, and model known as the bio biotic ligand model. And uh, we are demonstrating what, um, what is and isn't harmful to aquatic life based on the exact uh, water quality makeup of our receiving waters and our exact effluent rather than using broad hardness-based equations and other criteria to establish um, discharge limits for copper and zinc uh, in this case. Um, where we're at right now, we concluded the sampling. Uh, we put together uh, our um, summary reports. Um, we have been um, going back and forth with DEC uh, and EPA with our summary report of the status and our request to use site-specific criteria using this uh, BLM. Um, we have been um, having meetings and um, working back and forth using our consultant uh, who's been advising the city. Where we're at right now, the, the state DEC has um, um, started to put together their technical support document, which basically um, is, a, is a really huge milestone for this. Uh, it it uh, is their um, support and their support document for our approach. Uh, the reason um, being uh, it's a unique approach and EPA has to has to go through the approval process and and then a rulemaking process with the with the state of Alaska. So um, most of the technical aspects of this project have been accomplished and we are in the uh, back and forth report and discussion phase with DEC and EPA and none of that phase is quick, but it is, um, pro it is progressing satisfactorily. And in fact, once we reach this technical support document stage with DEC, we are um, really excited and, and DEC is eager to move forward in, in supporting this. And um, I don't have a conclusion date for you um, because we are working with EPA region 10 and EPA headquarters. So, um, we do want to uh, we do want to impress some urgency though, because longer is not always better with the changes in, in rules, changes in um, administrations, changes in a lot of different things. So um, that's where we're at with the with the discharge permit. It has been a long going project. We do see light at the end of the tunnel, and we have received positive um, positive milestones on on, on that project. I want to be real clear that what I'm going to say is about them. Okay, it's not about us here. I mean, this was, you know, um, $438,000 again. Um, in dealing with government and some other organizations I've been a part of, just to get signatures on pieces of paper, you have to pay $25,000 to get this signed or $40,000 for this uh, permit. One permit might cost them maybe five or six hours of work and, and others maybe hundreds of hours of work, but it's still the same amount you pay no matter what. Um, and so I just, I, I'm, I'm interested, because again, you guys are the experts. Um, <clears throat> in the past, and it certainly wasn't my term, but I've heard the term institutional bribes that you just pay just to get the government to give a signature. I do remember here in the past where we waited three years to get a signature so we could do some work on the uh, airport. Uh, and again, basically, one of the guys didn't like us, and so he just wouldn't sign, but there wasn't a fee with that. But again, sometimes there's institutional. And so my real question, do we, and, and I was really pleased with the stuff you, you started at the beginning because it kind of answers it, but do we actually get much for this 438000 I know we have to pay it, so I'm not resisting. I, 
because we'd just all die if we resist government. Um, do we get $438,000 worth? Excellent question, uh, Councilman McCary. Um, the very short three letter answer is yes. Excellent. We, 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 we do in, in, a, in a few senses. One, it's um, a lot of it is consulting fees, but there is a lot also, you know, I was shipping uh, 50 pound, two 50 pound coolers to Washington State twice a month because there is no laboratory in the state of Alaska that could, you know, do the, the testing and the clean room conditions that we required. And so there, there's, there's, there's um, consulting, contracting, other such costs. There's, there is certainly, uh, there is certainly um, red tape and paperwork costs incorporated into that budget, as, as you know, duly noted. Um, there's, also, there's also benefit to, um, you know, taking our time and working through this slowly and methodically. This actually represents, um, I don't know if I should say five years. Um, I will tell you this, our um, discharge permit has been expired and administratively extended for a number of years. And so I don't want to use the word buying as time, but um, the regulatory agencies have, uh, at their request, um, ex administratively extended our permit and not required us to implement very costly improvements at the wastewater treatment plant while we're embarked on this journey. So there's, there's, a, there's an ancillary benefit there too as well. And I do think that it's responsible of us because we are going through very expensive process to ensure that we are uh, environmentally responsible and that we are establishing limits that are um, very specific to, to our receiving waters and, and our effluent. So that's the, that's the long version of yes. And I just want to respond to that. That's really helpful. I mean, really, and, and I think a whole lot of our, I believe, a good deal of our citizenry would really benefit from hearing what you just said. Again, again, about the time and how it helped us and what it did when you talk about having to send stuff outside. Those types of details, although for some, they might find that trivial, um, I think that helps people understand what our government really does. And I also want to say I'm really pleased because, Sally, you're obviously a, a good advocate for government workers and what they're doing. But that came across well. I, I hope you're hearing this as a, a compliment. Absolutely. Okay? That you're the type of person I want to see work for the city of Sabatna. Not only do you have integrity, but also we're going to do the things that we're supposed to do, and particularly on something like wastewater treatment. Absolutely. So I just want to say your answer to me, and, and I understand that maybe other people may feel I'm wasting their time, but this is really helpful to me. Thank you. Vice Mayor Parker? Uh, if I may add my shorter answer to you know the question being, do we get anything for this $438,000? And I think the quick answer, which is what Kyle said more words, the quick answer is we get the assurance that we're doing a good job discharging into the river. This is part of this study is, is assuring, it's proving that, hey, we are taking care of our, really our valuable resource. And that's what I think is the best thing we got out of that all this time and effort is the assurance that we're doing a good job and we're not polluting that river. Vice Mayor Parker. Um, thank, thank you, Mayor Whitney, and uh, thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, in my previous life, having um, worked for a company that needed to renew, it was still an NPDES permit back then. Um, it took us eight years from the time that we made the application, which the permit had not expired, and in accordance with the rules, as long as the permit is not expired, you can continue to operate in compliance with that permit. So um, I know it takes time, and I know it takes uh, diligence, and thanks, Jay, for just sticking with it. Um, I had a couple of questions related overall to the overall capital projects. Um, the first one is, What's the percentage of work that is being completed by local contractors? I can't give you an exact figure, but I can give you the, uh, a broad uh, statement of the overwhelming majority since our biggest project by far is our airport reconstruction runway project, um, which the prime contractor is Connect Construction, a uh, local uh, construction firm uh, based here in Soldana, or very on the edge. Um, 
So uh, overwhelming proportion due to that. Um, a lot of the smaller projects uh, obviously are as well. You know, HR office remodels a local carpenter uh, contractor. Um, many many of them are. Um, some of the uh, I'd say it's a toss up when it comes to the professional services. We do have a, a, a broad array of really good professional services in our area. Some of the stuff like the wastewater treatment plant and those those specific genres. Um, we have our consultants from Anchorage uh, and the um, biosolids dewatering, and they are a local uh, Anchorage firm who is an expert in uh, water and wastewater and is doing a great job. On the discharge permit, we have um, HDR, who has an Anchorage office, uh, but is a global firm, and, and is, that's been a really good asset for us because part of their team is has been part of the, the team that helped develop some of the biotic ligand model uh, uh, systems. So, um, so I can't give you an exact figure, but I can tell you that um, a large portion is our, our local contractors, and we do enjoy when we see that, and we do have a you know um, a great professional and, and contracting community. And one one more question: um, through the course of these projects, have you had any unexpected items occur that have caused you issues or concern? There's always bumps in the road. Um, I can't think of any. Um, I can give you an example of, of a somewhat humorous uh, bump in the road um, that we discovered recently. It's not on this list, but it was a previous airport improvement grant. We built a snow removal equipment building, a $3 million um, grant project, and then we had recent power outages. And that's when we realized that the electronic gate uh, doesn't work when there is no power, and we did not install a um, man gate. <laughs> so, small bump in the road. Should we need to access that building when the power is out? Um, the good news is we have a, a man gate sitting in our boneyard that we will be installing here shortly. It, if you're on the inside, it's you can activate it and everything's groovy. But if you're on the outside, um, so always always a few little missteps. Um, but for the most part, I can't think of any any big um, any big issues. You know, like I mentioned on the air, the airport project uh, this summer, there are change orders. Change orders are a fact of life. Um, you know, they're they're a part of every construction project. Not uh, it's very uncommon if if uh, every little thing has been thought of ahead of time. And um, for the most part, like uh, working with our local contractors, um, you know, we work great with them. Um, we get fair fair pricing, and, and we negotiate those things and make sure that it's groovy and move forward. I'll add, um, you know, in that our climate these days with the pandemic the last couple of years, uh, pricing and availability of labor have really been a struggle. I mean, I think we're all seeing it even in our personal lives. But it's, uh, you know, contractors are having a hard time finding skilled labor and keeping skilled labor, and contractors are all busy. And then procuring materials has been both difficult to get and prices have been very volatile. So that, that's, that's made it more challenging to, uh, to plan for these projects. Um, I do have one comment. The um, Actually, maybe a couple of comments. It seems like I've been on the council through a little over eight years, and it seems like we've been talking about this discharge permit um, at least that long, if not longer. Um, so I guess my question is, if this all happens and everything lines up perfectly and we get the permit renewed, how long will that last? Um, I think the permits are on a five-year renewal cycle. Um, however... You know the the part that, uh, and and I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure they're on. They, our existing permit is on a five year <laughs> permitting cycle, but we haven't had a new permit in um, some time. So, um, five years is is uh, the renewal period for the permit. But we expect that this portion of the permit would would be um, can't can't guarantee it, but we would expect it to to last longer than that, based on uh, based on. Um, not having significant change in conditions, both in the receiving water and our airport. 
should things change drastically, obviously, that's yeah. off. Yeah, my other comment is under the new infrastructure bill, there's quite a bit of funding in there for uh, water and uh, wastewater uh, work. So I would hope we are really looking seriously at any project that uh, we might be able to get that funding for well in advance of when we. Yeah, I think we are keeping our uh, ear to the ground. Um, a lot of the funding we recognize is going to be going into existing programs um, that we know about or are aware and, and are, um, we don't typically use, although we, we have mostly loans, um, you know, state revolving fund loans and, and existing programs, a lot of money village safe water. Um, but we are eagerly anticipating new programs and we'll be keeping our eye out for opportunities in the water and wastewater in all of the sectors for the infrastructure bill for new programs that we that we may be able to take advantage of. So. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the uh, next item on the agenda is an item seven, public hearings, testimony limited to three minutes per speaker. First ordinance is ordinance 2021-027, authorizing the city manager and city attorney to sign an agreement with the Federal Aviation Administration for a grant provided under the American Rescue Plan, ARPA, for the Sadat and Municipal, Municipal Airport and increasing estimated revenues and appropriations by $32,000 in the airport fund. Introduced by city manager. Uh, may I have a motion to enact? Move to enact. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Ruffridge. A report from the administration. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. Uh, this ordinance would allow us to uh, sign a grant agreement and accept funds for the purpose of funding operations at the airport. And it's through the ARPA legislation, but it's similar to previous COVID-related relief bills um, where they had designated specific funding for airport use. And it's flexible in that it can fund uh, operational expenses. So acceptance of this grant will have the effect of reducing our expenditures in the airport account um, by $32,000. And Melanie would work to report eligible expenses as we incur them. Um, but it's broad in that it can uh, fund things that otherwise our, our airport fund would have to have funded. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the public hearing is now open. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? Uh, for those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participant by dialing star nine on your telephone. I see no one here in the chambers wishing to speak on the item. And looking at Zoom, I see no raised hand. So uh, we're back before the council. Are there any council comments? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. Councilmember Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Perry? Yes. Chilson? Yes. Student Representative Knowles? Yes. You have six yes votes. Thank you. Uh, ordinance 2021-027 uh, passes on a 6-0 vote. Uh, moving on to uh, item 8, uh, new business. That would be resolution 2022-01. Amending a job title in the Parks and Recreation Department from Administrative Clerk 2 to Administrative Assistant. Reclassifying the position from a salary range 7 to a range 11. And amending the authorized staffing table in the FY22, FY23 operating budget to reflect the changes. Introduced by the City Manager. May I have a motion to adopt? Vice Mayor Parker. Um, move to adopt Resolution 2022-001. Thank you, Mr. Carey. For the second. A report from the administration. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, this was a new position. We have had one person hold this position. It was added uh, recently to provide better customer service at the Parks and Rec Department. Um, it recently became uh, vacant again, and prior to re-advertising that position, we reviewed the, the existing job duties and responsibilities. And my opinion was that they were low the way it had previously been uh, classified at a range seven, and that the actual work that was being performed uh, by that person was more similar to an administrative assistant that we have uh, in many different departments, public works, um, finance, uh, streets and maintenance. And those are all uh, range 11 positions. So 
Um, I'm requesting that the council reclassify that to a range 11. This resolution has the effect of essentially amending that staffing table in the operating budget. So it would reclass that from a range 7 to a range 11. It would update the position title. We're not proposing to make changes to the job description itself because I think already it's fairly aligned with, with what administrative assistants are doing in other uh, departments within the city. It has an annual impact of approximately $7,000 that reclass. Uh, we are not asking for additional funding for the current fiscal year we're in for the remainder of this year. However, if this was approved um, at the mid biennium prior to the start of, of the fiscal, fiscal year that begins July 1, this would potentially be one of several updates that we bring back to the council for consideration for amending in FY23. Uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, public comment, our public uh, testimony is now open. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. I see no one here in the chambers wishing to speak on the item. And uh, looking at Zoom, I see no hands raised. Uh, having, hearing no one, uh, having no one who wishes to speak, the item is back before the council. Are there any council comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll call for the roll. Council Member Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Perry? Yes. Chilton? Yes. Parker? Yes. Student Representative Knowles? Yes. You have six yes votes. Uh, resolution 2022-002 passes on a 6-0 vote. Moving on to the next item oh, is uh, resolution 2022-002, amending the authorized use for COVID-19 community funding from the State of Alaska Department of Health and Social Services grant to include temporary emergency leave for city employees Introduced by the city manager, may I have a motion to adopt? Move to adopt. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Chilson. A report from the administration. Thank you, Mayor Whitney, and thank you to the council for allowing this to be added to the agenda for consideration tonight. Um, I have, for the past several weeks, been uh, working, soliciting input from department heads and working to update our internal uh, employee COVID personnel rules and those outline the expectations of our employees in terms of what to do if they're sick, what to do if they believe they've been potentially exposed to COVID, um, isolation periods, etc. And one of the pieces of uh, the proposal that I'd like to ask the council for authorization for is reinstituting a, a temporary emergency leave. The city has provided employees with temporary emergency leave at several points in time during the pandemic, mostly early on. Those were traditionally funded through uh, CARES Act funding. Um, I think it's going to be an uh, important piece of uh, our policy, especially over the next few weeks, the next month or so, because really what we're trying to do is allow employees to test often. We're going to be giving them at-home tests that they can self-administer if they believe they've been potentially exposed or if they're not feeling well and they're not sure if the symptoms might be COVID or something unrelated. Uh, but really I wanted to remove any financial barrier from people fully complying with the policy in terms of not being afraid to report a positive uh, case because they're concerned about their ability to miss uh, and isolate for those five days. Uh, the, when we were working on the updated draft, uh, we did some looking around to potentially identify funding sources and one of our existing grants does allow an emergency leave as an eligible use. It's the community funding grant through DHSS uh, the original amount was 195000 and then we requested an additional 100000 So we already have an existing grant agreement with the state for this particular funding, and we've been using it primarily through our subrecipient agreement with Soldat and Professional Pharmacy to staff the walk-in clinic at the Y. Uh, approval of this resolution would authorize me to work with DHSS to add that temporary emergency leave as an additional line item that's eligible under that grant. They've already identified it as an el eligible use, but this would authorize me to update our grant agreement for the purpose of uh, providing employees with up to 40 hours of, of paid leave if they are positive with COVID. Operationally, uh, I think that's important because in many of our departments, we are, we are small departments and the work is very specialized. For example, we spent a lot of time tonight talking about the water uh, wastewater plant. We only have four operators 
it would be very difficult for us to operate in a, in a situation where we potentially had had two or maybe more folks who were out sick at a time. So by granting this leave, um, I think we're supporting our employees to stay home and make the right choices if they are in fact sick. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions and, and thank you for, as I mentioned, uh, adding this to the agenda tonight for consideration. Thank you. Uh, now I'll go into the uh, public comment. Can I answer? Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. The app uses by pressing the raise your hand button and, home, and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. I see no one in the chambers wishing to speak on this matter. Will you move to Zoom? And I see no hands raised. Uh, having no one who wishes to speak, the item is back before the council. Are there any council comments? Mr. Cherry. Question for the manager. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as permanent emergency leave? Um, to Mr. Carey, through the mayor, uh, so the other paid leave that employees have is their personal leave, which is uh, accrued at a rate uh, commensurate with how long they've been with the city. So currently the city provides paid personal leave, right. and what we've been doing most recently is that if someone had to quarantine or had to be out of work due to COVID or, mm -hmm. or any other unrelated illness, they would be using their own personal leave. Um, we used the term temporary emergency leave for those two or three previous times when we issued uh, leave during the COVID pandemic. So that's just the phrase that we've used. Um, I'm not aware of what a permanent version of that would look like. When we'd done this in the past, it was for a time limited amount of time. So we would provide up to 40 hours for individuals and they would be eligible to use that leave up to a certain date, at which point it would expire. So what I'm, can I continue with this? So what I'm trying to understand is, um, it sounds like it's emergency leave. And so I, I guess I don't understand what's the difference between emergency leave and temporary emergency leave. Uh, Mr. Carey, through the mayor, so the, the wording of emergency is not critical. That's just what, our, what we had called um, additional leave that was granted above and beyond what's called, outlined in the personnel code. This particular leave would only be used if an employee tested positive for COVID. Um, it's not related to or tied to a declared emergency. As, as you know, we're not under a declared emergency. Um, but that's just from the HR world, what we had been calling it is just an additional leave that the city has the ability to grant for a set amount of time specific very much to uh, COVID isolation. And did I hear you say, I, I believe so, that the grant itself, it does use the term temporary emergency. Uh, you say that, Mr. Carey, through the mayor, that's the term we've used throughout oh, the pandemic for additional leave. The grant itself, um, I don't know that they would call it that necessarily. Okay. And so and I, I'm not trying to believe this. So we're not trying to carve out anything particular. It was just that's the term that we've been using, temporary emergency. Right. And um, through the mayor, earlier on in the pandemic, when we were in a a formal declared emergency, the council had granted me authorization to act above and beyond temporarily suspending rules. And so the earlier iterations of this leave, I had the authority to implement and then report back to the council. Now that we're no longer operating under that framework, um, I felt it would not be within my powers to grant additional leave that's not specified in the Soldatna um, personnel code, the municipal code, without coming to the council to seek authorization and, and identifying that funding source. Excellent. Thank you very much for the explanation. Vice Mayor Palka. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, City Manager, can you refresh us what the city policy is with respect to employees, uh, our COVID policy? Uh, sure. Uh, Vice Mayor Parker, through the mayor. Um, the policy that I'm going to be implementing later this week um, it's, it's in some ways similar to what we've been doing with some new aspects. So we are still requesting that uh, any employee who's experiencing potential symptoms of COVID, that they get tested. Now, previously they'd been doing that through one of the local providers that's offering testing. It's covered under our health insurance. But one of the new things that we'll be doing is allowing people to self-administer those at-home tests themselves. So that's gonna provide some additional flexibility to employees if they've got a headache or if they've got a sore throat and they want to just double check, they'll now have the ability to do that at home. So we ask them to test if they've experienced any of those symptoms that potentially could be COVID. Um, we are asking them to isolate in 
accordance with the time frame outlined by the CDC. So those were recently updated and, and we've updated the policy to reflect the new guidance from CDC about isolation uh, time frames, as well as wearing a mask when you come back to work within that 10 day uh, period from when you tested positive. We've got uh, guidelines on quarantining. Um, however, the new version of the policy will potentially get people back to work sooner as long as they comply with some additional protocols. So people will be allowed to come to work if they believe they may have been exposed, but they will be wearing a mask, they will be testing on day five, and we will be potentially working to give them some more space. So they'll be working with their supervisor to, to minimize contact either with coworkers or, um, or the public. All of these things together, um, I think, give us reasonable assurance that we're taking adequate steps as an employer to maintain a healthy workplace for our, our employees, but also to protect the public as they come to us to access our services. Um, so we've had a, a policy like that for some time. It's been uh, periodically updated. I think this would be version number six that I'm getting ready to roll out uh, that we talked about with all the department heads on Tuesday. Um, in terms of masks, our employees, I just ask that they wear masks whenever they can't maintain social distancing. So currently, uh, if they're indoors and they're within six feet of a coworker or a member of the public, everybody's got them with them, they'll put it on. If they're in a private office or they've got space or they're working outdoors, we're not requiring them to do that at this point. So that's, that's generally kind of the basis of what we're, we're asking folks to do at this point. Any questions? Is this a 140 hour per employee? Or if they get COVID more frequently, do you give them 40 hours each time? Uh, Ms. Hutchings through the mayor, I, I am, imagine this would be a one time uh, leave bank essentially. There would be 40 hours added to a person's leave bank. We would track it separately from personal leave. It doesn't have any monetary value, you couldn't cash it out. But for the amount of time where we felt that the leave was necessary, they would have those 40 hours. And if they tested positive, um, they would be eligible to use that time. I will point out that many of our employees may not need to use this leave at all because many of us can telework. We, uh, you might remember me talking about rolling out a telework policy. We did that actually early in 2020. So for example, if I were to test positive or department head or many of our employees who can accomplish their work from home or another location, potentially they would be able to still work. They would just be doing it remotely and they also may not need to dip into this leave. It's mostly for folks if in the case that someone was very ill and couldn't work or they were in a position where telework wasn't offered to them, they potentially would be able to use these 40 hours during the period of time where we make it available. Any other, Ms. Perry? I was just wondering, in our policy for employees, during those time periods in which they're required to wear masks, do we state what type of masks? There's certainly been a lot of discussion, particularly recently, on the efficacy of different types. Do we have a stated uh, expectation of what type of mask? Uh, thank you, Mr. Carey. Currently, we do not. Um, and as you mentioned, there's been some changing guidance on uh, which type of masks might be more effective. What we have done is we, we will provide masks to employees at no cost. We've got different kinds. We just ordered some new of the KN95 masks that are a little bit tighter fit, fitting and a lighter, uh, maybe a bit higher level of protection for folks. But at this point, we have allowed people to choose whatever they're most comfortable with. Um, and, and that's worked out okay for folks in terms of them making that choice. But certainly up until now, we've, we've also tried to educate people. So even though we're not mandating a particular mask, we've tried to share good information as we get it in terms of what folks can be considering uh, to, to keep themselves and the people around them safest. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. Council Member Nelson? Yes. Carey? Yes. Chilton? Yes. Parker? Yes. Hutchings? Yes. Student Representative Knowles? Yes. You have five yes votes and one abstention. Uh, resolution resolution 2022-002 passes on a 5-0 vote with one abstention. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is mayor and council report. Uh, mayor's report and proclamations. There was no proclamations this evening. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of things that have gone on here recently. Um, 
in December, I uh, was honored to uh, be invited to the grand opening of the VA clinic um, over across the street from the Heritage Place. That is now open and fully, almost fully functional. They don't have a flagpole up yet. We'll have to do that come springtime. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful facility, uh, much larger than their old system over in Kenai, uh, and uh, much more convenient because it's a one-stop shop now. It, uh, they're going to have audiology in there, podiatry, um, counseling, homeless uh, uh, coordinator, and things like that. Uh, like I said, we had a tour of it. It's uh, a gorgeous facility, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see our veterans have got such a nice facility and here in Sobaka. The other one is um, the, uh, the city mayors of um, Seward, Kenai, Homer, and, and myself and Soldatna. Uh, we had a brief meeting here last week uh, to discuss issues that are common to all of us here on four, four uh, cities. Uh, we're planning on doing this more often, maybe at least on a quarterly basis to discuss issues that uh, affect all of us and uh, see what we can do and uh, bring forth uh, hopefully some solutions and some new ideas. Um, there's the other one that is the Seabelt uh, group that met last week. Or was this week? Trying to keep track of time now. Um, and that is the coastal communities um, that uh, uh, even though we're not a coastal community, we participated in it. Uh, when I say we, City of Soldotna participated in it uh, because anything that happens to our three communities here on the peninsula that our seacoast community affects us. Uh, so we're lending our support. Uh, they're going to uh, expand this uh, group or at least uh, make it more visible. Uh, it's going to be kind of on the lines of the rail belt community, uh, but it's going to be the sea belt. And there'll be more hopefully more uh, um, support uh, coming through for projects that will help uh, the community, coastal communities. Uh, another quick thing, uh, we are due for our annual photos. So uh, the city clerk will be contacting everyone to get together so we can hopefully in February, uh, maybe even do a group shot of all of us together instead of having a montage like we did last year. So I think uh, Mr. Nelson will need a photo. Maybe Ms. Hutchings, I think. Did you get a new photo? Okay, so there'll be, uh, the city clerk will be contacting everyone on that. Uh, reminder to everyone, it's that time of year to file the APOC reports. Um, I can't remember what the deadline is. I think it's the end of March or something like that. Mr. the mayor, it's March 15th. Just pop online and get it done. Uh, I did it on Sunday, did that, and uh, PFD filed it. Uh, AML is in February. I don't know if anyone planning on going, but it'll be in Juno. Uh, plans are still to do the in-person meetings. Uh, we'll meet with some of the legislatures down, legislators down there, assuming that um, the Capitol is open and they'll have any restrictions. But, and the last one on my thing, is uh, I will not be here physically for the January 26th meeting, uh, but I will participate by Zoom, and I would ask uh, Vice Mayor Park to actually conduct the meeting um, here in person. And that's all I have. So moving on to council reports and boards and commissions. So about the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, Ms. Hutchings. So I went to the meeting. It was a rather short meeting. Uh, Caitlin Baca was re-elected as chair and Charlene Kapfess as vice chair. Um, Mr. Sosnarski did a great job of giving us a year of 2021 in review. And then the big discussion was the core downtown, um, how we want the businesses that we would like or they would like to see in the corridor and how much property is actually out there as you know, we all think that there's no property left, but there's quite a bit in that core. But they only looked at the Seward Highway. They didn't look at the Kenai Spur. So some of the items that they thought we should have in the Seward Highway, we already, or Sterling Highway, we already had in the Spur Highway. So, you know, there's a little bit of 
not looking at the whole picture. Our core is Kenai Spur and Sterling Highway. But it was it was very interesting. Uh, John brought some really good uh, maps and layouts so we can see where we're going. And that was about it. Thank you. There is no other council reports this evening. We'll move on to item 10, city manager report. Thank you, Mayor Whitney. Uh, first, and it was a nice visit, I wanted to um, thank Chief Molnarek. His last day was Friday. Um, I have named Lieutenant Dwayne Cant as the interim chief, and we are currently advertising the position internal applicants only. So for this week, we're gonna advertise internally as required under our code, and I hope to be able to update you soon about how that process is going. Um, we had a meeting with uh, Marcus Mueller from the borough. The borough obtained some really advanced uh, pictometry, which is the ortho, the above images, either from satellite or airplane. Um, they acquired them for the whole borough, but uh, I think primarily to assist with assessing department. But they have the ability through that contract to share that data with other municipalities. And so we met with the borough and the city of Kenai together to discuss the, the potential of a draft memorandum of, of understanding whereby the borough could share that data with us and we would um, have access to that imagery. So we're, we provided some comments back to them on the draft MOU and, and I hope to be able to bring that forward soon. But it, it, it'd be really neat to have that. It, it assists us in lots of different things from planning to projects to uh, just generally uh, that that imagery is great to have. It's been some years since we've updated ours or that they've acquired updated imagery. So um, it's going to be really helpful to us in general to be able to work with them on that. Question? Yes, is it okay now? Would that be anything like what we have behind us? Behind is, does it have that quality of update? Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Carey. It is of a quality that we have never had. So uh -huh. Um, if you think of pixels being right. a, a, a cube of earth, I think the highest resolution imagery I've ever seen is maybe in like the half a meter. So if you yeah. can think of every one and a half feet, that's a, a pixel. This imagery is at like three inch or six inch. So um, it is very high resolution imagery. Uh, they have um, building footprints from that data. They've got the ability to kind of view structures from several different directions, um, very high quality imagery. And they had acquired it for the Eastern Peninsula Seward area. And then I think for the other, the remainder of the, the peninsula, um, I think they're also planning to upload it to the public viewers. So for the public who accesses the borough's GIS, uh, the interactive mapper, um, I believe that uh, Bobby Lay, their, their um, uh, GIS tech, had indicated that that might also be available for the public to view, but it would also enable us to download it onto our own system and use it in, in mapping, planning, et cetera. Very high resolution. Would you anticipate that that would include, could we get a possible cost if we wanted to do something like that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Carey. We'll certainly look into that. Part of what this MOU will outline for us mm -hmm. is what are the allowable uses right. based on their contract. Yeah. And um, if we wanted to potentially update some of the things we've got here, um, I'll certainly look into that. That'd be very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just a couple more things that are on my list. Um, Mr. Cornelis and I had a meeting with um, two of Senator Murkowski's staff members, Jane Conway, who's in the local office, and then Angela Ramponi, who was visiting from the DC office. Angela has been tasked with soliciting questions related to the infrastructure bill, of which we all are quite excited to talk about and learn more about. Um, I think it was a very good conversation. We were able to um, re-familiarize them with some of the council's priority projects. And we plan to have a, a follow-up meeting that we'll schedule with the DC staff um, because it sounds like this infrastructure bill, although many of them were intimately involved, some of them even in writing and drafting the legislation, it's a big bill and there's many pieces of it. So they've graciously offered for us to have a meeting where we can run through the project list with all the relevant uh, team members so that if there's opportunities for any of our projects to fit in any of those funding pathways, they can help us identify those. So we've got the five-year capital plan and although we normally Format, format that chronologically. We're working on a new formatting which will group it by um, topic. So transportation projects would be together, water sewer projects together, 
parks and economic development would be together. So we're currently updating that. And as soon as we do, we'll share that with you and uh, the public, but also primarily the audience is gonna be state and federal legislators and their staff so that we can get them our projects and hopefully they're memorable and they'll stick in the front of their mind as opportunities become available. A couple other quick things. Uh, Mr. Zarneski had a meeting, I think yesterday with FEMA and the state uh, regarding our wildfire prevention grant application. This is the Spruce Park Beetle funding he identified maybe two years ago. Um, they are, the purpose of the meeting was to update us on the progress of the environmental assessment, the EA that they're gonna be doing. Um, it's required that they do this and they wanna actually get on site prior to giving us the formal approval for the grant funds. And it sounds like they may be able to do that in June. Following that, uh, when they complete the EA, there will be a public comment period. And so if everything goes according to, to plan, uh, best case scenario is we might expect to see that funding award offer in the fall. So this is the roughly 300,000 uh, that we potentially would be receiving to help us mitigate wildfire risk by removing spruce bark beetle. So that it's forward progress, it's slow, but um, happy to at least have a little bit more information on, on the timing of that EA process moving forward. I wanna give a quick kudos. I received a very appreciative uh, voicemail today from a longtime resident on Endicott. He's been there since the 80s and he said the, um, the snowplow operator is the best he's ever seen in that whole time. So give a shout out to Scotty and I think Ryan was driving the, the blade. So good job guys, love to have that feedback. Very last thing, uh, today the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics issued uh, the cost of living adjustment for last year. Um, we had the first half of last year, um, I believe was 3.4% uh, consumer price index increase, and then the second half of the year was higher, 6.35. So we're looking at an annual increase in 2021 of about 4.9%. It's a little bit higher than we've, we've had in recent years. Although going back, looks like 2008 was the next highest. It was at 4.6. So we're in the middle of the two-year budget process, but one of the things that we did tell you that we would come back with is a mid-biennium a mid adjustment. And specifically, one of the things that we would intend to consider as part of that request is cost of living adjustment for the salary schedule, as well as um, potentially some other changes. But we just now got that data. And between now and June, we will be reviewing it, taking a look at things, and potentially coming back to the council uh, closer to the start of the new fiscal year. Um, and, and that COLA piece will be one piece of that. So I just wanted to share that, that data with you, and that concludes my report, but I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Any questions for the city manager? I do have one quick one. Uh, I know the borough had put in four, and, and we had uh, supported it. Uh, I think it was a 32 or $33 million uh, grant for uh, tree removal, fire protection, whatever. Have you heard anything on the, what the status of that is? Uh, thank you, Mayor Whitney. Um, you're correct that they had submitted that request to, to the federal delegation, and we had supported it. We did ask that question, and we're not made aware of any forward progress. So at this point... Um, we haven't heard any updates. I'm not necessarily expecting that request to move forward. Um, Thank you. And we'll move on to uh, item 11 on the agenda, public comment. Members of the public will have three minutes to comment. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment? Uh, for those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. Seeing no one in the chambers, and I see no hands raised on Zoom. So we'll move on to item 12 on the agenda, council comments. And we'll start out with uh, student representative Noel. Um, well, we have some exciting news, which is that we can, or uh, the school board so far is allowing us to do prom, uh, which wasn't even really a question last year. So uh, it's really exciting that they're saying, if things continue the way they have been continuing, then we should be allowed to do prom in the school. Um, you decided on the date of April 2nd, um, and there's going to be basketball games on Friday, as well as hockey games, and the graduation for the seniors this year will take place on the football field also. 
Thank you. We will now move on to Mr. Rutheridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, not really many uh, comments tonight. Just uh, was excited to see uh, in the news recently the opening of the uh, shelter out in the Nikiski area and uh, recent report that it's already about half full. Uh, so that is just a, a huge uh, lift and um, help to our community and uh, just a huge thanks to all the people uh, who worked hard to make that happen. Um, there is a lot of uh, unsung heroes and people that have been working very hard at that for many, many years. And um, I know this group has talked a lot about it in the past and I want to thank our city manager and city planner for really pushing hard on uh, ways to help with that. And uh, I think this is a, uh, a huge accomplishment uh, for our community and uh, just uh, exciting to see something happen in that regard. So that's uh, all my comments this evening. Thank you. Mr. Carrick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I sure like having meetings where we're all here together. I, I've got to tell you, it just uh, it uh, enlivens me. It's, it's just so much better. And I just think there's much better dialogue and uh, better communication. I also want to say, um, and I like being an optimist, um, I think they're getting a handle on this COVID thing, or at least the disease itself is getting a handle so that uh, it sure sounds like we're going to move much more toward normalcy, uh, much more toward this being one of the things that people deal with in their life, uh, as they do with many other viruses, many other things, and uh, um, that uh, there'll be medication and, and remediations to uh, help so that uh, society can get back to where it needs to be. And so I feel really good, and it's a wonderful time to be alive. Vice Mayor Parker. Uh, no comments tonight. Thank you. Mr. Chilson. Uh, no comments tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Nelson. I am the same. Nothing. Thank you. Ms. Hutching. Well, I guess I'll talk. Um, <clears throat> again, the homeless shelter is a great thing. It was wonderful that Siri and Rasmussen came together and funded that whole project. I, I can't tell you how many people I have spoken to that are so delighted that that's open. But the other thing, on kind of a sadder note, um, you know, Ed Rasmussen died in the last week or so, and he was so instrumental in ho helping so many people and all over the state, but also on the peninsula. The homeless shelter was one. Uh, the Kenai Peninsula Community Care Center was another. Um, the uh, Boys and Girls Club. I mean, the list goes on and on. So we really lost a great guy. Thank you. And just to add something to um, the homelessness issue, uh, Project Homeless Connect will be having their um, annual event at the uh, Sports Center on January the 26th. Uh, if anyone's interested in volunteering or helping out there, uh, I believe it'll start at uh, about 8.30 in the morning and go until 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Moving on to the next item on the agenda is item number 13, the exec executive session, uh, United Cook Inlet Drift Association and Cook Inlet Fishermen's Fund versus National Marine Fisheries Service and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, City Attorney Brooks Chandler, AS, AS 44.62.310C3, matters which by law, municipal charter, or ordinance are required to be confidential. In accordance with this Alaska statute, uh, attorney-client communications are matters which by law, municipal charter, or ordinance are required to be confidential. Therefore, may be held in executive session. May I have a motion to enter into executive session? Vice Mayor Parker? So moved. That we enter into an executive session to discuss the Cooking and Drift Association litigation. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Ruffridge. Are there any objections to convening into executive session? Seeing none, uh, for those attending through Zoom, the Zoom meeting will end and will not be resumed after the executive session. There is no further business to be taken up after the executive session. However, after the executive session is over, the meeting will briefly resume at uh, soldatna.org slash streaming. Make that motion while we're in open session. Sure. 
you need a second for that? Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Tilson, thank you. Any objections of coming out of executive session? Seeing none, motion passes by unanimous consent. Next item on the agenda is meeting announcements. Uh, January 17th, 2022's Library Advisory Board at 5.15 p.m. January 26th, 2022 is a city council meeting here in the chambers at 6 p.m. Having nothing uh, more in front of us, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.